One of the coolest things about coaching is it's focused on outcomes. But when it comes to outcomes, there are three types of people. And the first is those people who have never decided on the outcomes they're looking for. They don't really know what they want. They've never asked that question. They've just focused on settling for what they can get. So obviously those people never get what they want because they don't even know what they want. Now the second group of people are those that know what they want and are quite clear about the outcomes they're looking for, but for whatever reason, fall short of them. Never seem to get that. The third group know what they want and get what they want. Extraordinary group of people and a very rare group of people. But here's my best thought about how do you become one of those people. How do you get what you want? How do you see dreams come to reality? How do you achieve goals? Uh, I think the most extraordinary thing in life is seeing a person flourish. I reckon that's what we're created for. I reckon that's what we have the potential. It lies inside of us, yet few live it. Here's how it happens. So we start with the, start with the conversation around outcomes. And the first piece of the puzzle is to know what it is that you want. What are you looking for? Be specific in every area of life. Your marriage, your family, your health, your finances, your career, and your personal life. What do you want? Now, once you're clear about that, the next thing we're going to need to, to ask is why. So if you had that, what would that give you? This explores the purpose behind what we want and helps us to get more and more specific about what we really want as opposed to what we think that we want. Very, very important, and it gets us clear about the outcomes we desire which is crucial for coaching. Whenever I'm doing this journey with someone um, and they get clear about that, intuitively they jump to, okay, well, that's where I want to be. Well, here's obviously where I am now. So, so clearly I need to take some massive action and work hard to get what I want. I get my observation is there are lots and lots of people who are doing this and very, very few of them are doing it with any kind of success. It's intuitive, you think, okay, I've just gotta work hard, I've just gotta be focused, I've just gotta be driven, I've just gotta be determined, that's how you get what you want, you do stuff. Yet, uh, I, I reckon it's cool because um, it's almost like there's this magical force field that locks people out of that, if that's their approach. And it takes a very different route to actually get there, which is all about what I've discovered. So instead of just grinding it out, hard work, um, which is never going to get there, and it, the, the funny thing about this is that people who, who use this approach get so close, they feel like it's just around the corner, it's just there, but they've been saying that for the last 10 years, and it's actually not getting any closer, it's getting further away. So if that road's locked, let's take a left-hand turn and explore something which, is, which has nothing to do with outcomes, um, but everything to do with creating a wonderful state which makes outcomes possible. Rituals are an often a neglected part of our life which have a massive effect on the results that we get. Because of this, they affect our state. Our mental and emotional state. Now, when I'm in a great state, what I can achieve in one hour I can't replicate in three days of being in a poor state. I'm sure you can relate to that. Every state has an associated set of possibilities. That's something like it. So when I'm in a great state, now creativity becomes possible. Now wisdom becomes possible. Now I have access to resourcefulness, to energy, to motivation. All these things are now on the table where before I didn't have access to them. Those things were not possible. And likewise, now the door has been closed on a whole set of impossibilities. So now, now procrastination becomes impossible. Now time wasting is impossible. Now um, not connecting with people becomes impossible. Of course those things are going to happen. Likewise, um, a poor state, uh, procrastination is very possible. In fact, that's the only thing that's going to happen. And creativity now becomes impossible. It's like, I just don't have access to it. The cool thing about this is, outcomes then are merely the fruit. They are the, they are the result that has been produced by this set of possibilities and this set of impossibilities created by that state. So if you don't like the outcomes you're getting, it's not their fault. They're the exact outcomes that your system has been designed to produce. If 
you don't like the outcomes that you're generating, well, it's a direct result of the possibilities you have access to and the ones you don't, driven by that state which has been generated by these rituals. So if you want to change your rituals, which are the small things, the insignificant things, the little things that you do regularly, then you would change your outcomes. Extraordinary. So my thought is this. State is king. When I get up in the morning, I resist the temptation to think, okay, what do I need to do to get what I want? Because I'm very focused on what I want. I know that clearly. I live in that space. But I, I, instead of going, what do I need to do today to get what I want? My question is, what do I need to do to get into state? Because once I'm in state, the game changes. Then I have access to what I really need. Then I have access to my best self. And if I have access to my resourcefulness, then look out. Because I'm going to get some incredible results. And they're going to be the things that I really want. So... Um, the cool thing about once you understand this is, if state is king, well, and we've all had we've all had experiences of being in a great state, um, but the problem is if you can't control your state, well, then you can't control your outcomes. If, on the other hand, you can control your state, you can control your outcomes. So, uh, some of the cool rituals that I practice, which affect my state, uh, are um, they're very life giving things, which are very subjective, so they're great for me, and they might not be great for another person. Um, and, and before I explain my list, let me, let me just uh, detail a very important distinction between rituals and disciplines. Disciplines are actions very connected to outcomes, where rituals are actions that are nothing to do with the outcomes, but everything to do with state. For instance, if one of the outcomes that I wanted was to run a marathon under three hours, which I did a few years ago, um, Discipline would be, okay, I'm going to need to train seven to ten times a week. I'm going to need to get up to 100 or 120 Ks a week. I'm just going to need to discipline that for the next 16 weeks and just get it done. Now, that's actually a plan that's not going to work because I can maintain that discipline for the first three or four weeks, but then my muscles get sore and it gets cold and it's wet outside and I don't feel like it and just the energy and the motivation drops. Yet, a ritual which may be far more useful for me might be um, on a Monday morning, go up to Rocky Hill, which is my favourite part of Goulburn. It's like a sacred space for me. Uh, and watch a YouTube clip of someone achieving their goals. Completely unrelated to running, but just something cool. And j just that five minutes in that favourite space um, creates an extraordinary state for me where now I have access to high levels of motivation and energy. And of course I'm going to go running. I could not go running in that state. So some of my rituals... Uh, um, I go into the movies once a fortnight by myself. Popcorn and Coke. doesn't really matter what's on. I just love going. I just feel energised by it. It's just me time. It's just really cool. Uh, journaling. Uh, meditating. Reading before bed. Uh, cooking porridge on a Friday morning. Normally I have muesli flakes. And that's good. And that's a ritual. Everything we do is a ritual. And that creates a certain state. But on Friday I have a slower start to the day. I, I normally go uh, for a 40k bike ride with some mates. Uh, come home. Uh, get the paper, cook porridge. Now, I put lots of butter, salt, full cream milk, make a really creamy batch, which reminds me of my nan. And I just, I just love it. I just enjoy that. Now, someone else might think, oh, that's a waste of time, and that, that creates a poor state. But for me, it's very life-giving, and the effect is, 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 is beautiful. I'm playing golf. I love sport. Um, golf's just, it's just lovely, especially this time of year. It's just so green and lush, and just that walk by myself, um, I just, it's just good for me. It's good for my soul. Um, dinner with great friends. And I just love it. I just love, I love beautiful people. And I love hanging out with them. Uh, you know, these kind of things are rituals for me that create a great state. And when I practice them, it affects um, what I have access to and the outcomes that I get. So here's how this works, right? This is, this is really, really important because it's, number one, we've got to know what we want. Number two, we've got to know why we want it. Uh, number three, th and this is the game changer, who would we need to be to get what we really want? It's the be, do, have model. Instead of work at what you want to have and then go do some stuff to get that, it's actually much different. It's actually who do I need to be and when I was being that, then what kind of person, what, what would I do, sorry, and then when I would have the things that I want. I was, uh, I've got a friend who's an author, writes some incredible stuff, um, but he was lamenting the fact that only 2% of authors will ever 
publish their book well enough to justify the time, energy, and money they spent in producing that work in the first place. And it's just like, it's so frustrating. I feel like I'm writing incredible stuff, but no one wants to publish it, and it's just so hard. And I'm, I'm just really de- depressed and discouraged about it. And so I said to him, well, you of all people would know that it's not just the top 2% of books that get published. I'm sure there's some books you read where you think, how in the world did that ever get published? And how did it sell so many copies? And then some extraordinary books that have never been published and never seen the light of day, which you think is an extraordinary waste. So the people who get their book published, the 2%, who are they? How are they being that gives them access to that kind of result? And who would you need to be to get your book published? The kind of people who get that, um, how do they talk? How do they walk? What do they believe about themselves? What do they dress? How do they dress? What car do they drive? What places do they go? Who do they hang out with? What is it about them that gives them access to that? When, when I was uh, first understanding this, uh, the, the guy who introduced me to the coaching center in the first place, who's a great mate of mine, Greg Bellingham, helped me think about it in a bit more depth. He said that inside each of us, we have a range of different states and, and a range of different personalities that go with these states and therefore get a range of different outcomes in different spaces. So he said, imagine you could invite all your characters to sit around a table and have a conversation with them to discover who they are and what, what results they've been getting. So I was thinking about that in, in, in my life and here's an example of some of my characters. Uh, so when I was at high school, my nickname was Fraze. Uh, my surname was Fraser, so yeah, Fraser is very creative. Um, but Fraser is a sheep farmer from Collector. He uh, he's, you know, wears home-made clothes, you know, that his mum's made and she's, she's borrowed designer labels and stuck them on her clothes. But all the kids know that, so, you know, it's a bit embarrassing. Hasn't discovered hair gel, uh, a little bit overweight, a um, bit of a nerd, li- likes people, would love to be in the cool group, but just not. <laughs> yeah, doesn't have many friends. Just a pretty uh, conservative kind of guy. Fraser, he's still at my table, um, you know, 20 years on, 15 years on, um, and... Doesn't get much airtime, but it was interesting because when I went to write my book, uh, Fraser was the character who said, really, um, who are you and where are you from? What are you going to do, write a book? And then, okay, good luck with that. So Fraser sabotaged that process for a number of years until I discovered um, Rushman is another one of my characters who uh, has lots of great ideas and thinks they're all incredible and all need to happen yesterday. Highly impulsive, highly impatient, say yes, work out how later, just go get them. <laughs> um, creates, you know, does a lot of stuff but does nothing well and leaves a trail of mess um, and creates dramas for my wife who, you know, just is always cleaning up after things done poorly. Uh, then I've got the pink shirt guy who's the entrepreneur that's emerged in the last four years. Learned about business, learned how to make money, learned to break through the poverty mentality, um, learned how to go play with the big boys, has pioneered business, uh, has learned the coaching skill set. Uh, has trained other coaches, has done all kinds of extraordinary things, but such an anxious character. Doesn't really feel like he belongs there. Um, just faking it till he makes it. And, and I think both Pink Shirt Guy and Rushman are high anxiety characters because they're very tied to outcomes. They've got to see things happen a certain way and when they don't, uh, uh, you know, what, we, what are we going to do? Um, then I've got a breakout character who I've called the Bandit, who, you know, if, if Rushman and Pink Shirt Guy are creating too much anxiety and too much stress, and it's like, this is unsustainable. I'm going to go do something reckless just to sabotage this and just, you know, so you get a break. Um, my most realised character is a guy named Rusty. I'll spare you the details of how that name came about. But needless to say, Rusty is the only relaxed character at my table. Um, I'm not trying to prove anything to anyone. Knows I've done some incredible stuff in the past and will do some, some great things in the future. But doesn't really need to do any of those things. While the pink shirt guy kind of defined himself as the, as the hero or the fix-it guy or the pioneer, um, you know, Rusty's far more relaxed about that. And when there's opportunities, great, but not defined by them, so can is free to be engaged and not, not, not be engaged. Um, we've had this extraordinary uh, last 12 months as a family where we found a block of land which, which we've been dreaming about forever and it was kind of out of our reach and we didn't know how we are going to make it happen and we committed ourselves to making it happen and... Pink shirt guy and Rushman was so anxious about that. Just every time they think about it, would fall apart thinking, I don't know how in the world I'm going to make this happen. And I felt responsible as you know, head of my home to kind of pull it all together, earn the money, do whatever to, to make it happen. But Rusty, on the other hand, um, was very relaxed about it. Rusty was like, this is a beautiful and compelling future for my family. We'll find a way. 
And every time we'd face a no or a challenge or, or a hindrance for us, he would be like, it's okay. If you won't work it out, we'll find someone because this is where we're going to live. This is our future. We're going to grow old. We're going to grow old here. So, so when I think about Rusty, right, um, when I think about the, the outcomes I'm looking for in life, who do I need to be? Well, I need to be Rusty. So then I'm like, well, if I need to be Rusty, what rituals do I need to practice that create that state for me? Rituals around belief and confidence and dressing well. Here's the, here's the interesting thing about state, right? Each state has, has three key components. Um, first, it has a focus. So in every state, we're focused on different things. That's what creates that state. Uh, you know, in a great state, you focus on opportunities and possibilities. In a poor state, you're focused on uh, failures and hurts and disappointments. Every state has a physiology. Uh, in a great state, you know, we're happy. You know, faces lit up, shoulders back, standing tall. In a poor state, you know, it's manifest in our body. Uh, and every state has a language. The way we speak creates our reality. It doesn't Our words don't just describe how we feel, they shape how we feel. So the kind of words affect your state. So part of my rituals are deliberately practicing empowering language, deliberately dressing well, eating well, being healthy, um, deliberately focusing on cool things, opportunities. Now, um, like I said to you before, the important thing here is going to be how we can control state. Because if state is king, and when I'm in state, the game changes, and state is what I need to get access to what I really want, I'm going to need rituals, but I'm also going to need anchors. This is a term taken from the world of NLP, um, and it's all about what happens in the height of an emotional state when your senses are triggered. Those two things get linked neurologically. So I'm sure you can all um, relate to this, especially with, with smells. There, are, there will be certain fragrances that if you randomly were to smell that, they transport you back in time almost, not just to the memory, but also to the emotion associated with that memory. Certain songs, I'm sure, trigger things inside you. Certain touches, certain places you go to, they're all anchored, they're linked. Now, knowing that that's how the brain works, we can create anchors. We can build in resource anchors linked to state. So, here's how I did, that, did this for me, right? Um, so, okay, what do I want? Yes, I'm clear about what I want. Uh, who do I need to be? I need to be rusty. That's the kind of character at my table I need to be. Now, what rituals would help me practice being rusty? Great, well, I'm going to need to dress well, I'm going to go to meditate, I'm going to go to journal, I'm going to go to take time out for me, I'm going to have to eat porridge, I'm going to go to the movies, I'm going to, uh, you know, all these kind of things. And once I'm rusty, then, okay, how do I anchor this moment, this feeling, this state, so that I can get back in there quickly? So I, I built a rusty playlist. So that when I was in that state, there were just certain songs that I would listen to, and I put them on a playlist. Um, when I was feeling like rusty, there's just a certain coffee shop that I'd go to. Uh, there were certain clothes that I would wear. This jacket, for instance, this is rusty. Um, when I put this on, I feel different. Um, there is, there's a, a cologne which I've just linked to rusty. So when, when I want to be rusty, just that smell, um, it takes me back there. It just, I'm, in a, I'm in the zone. I'm in, I'm in my space. These, these kind of things help me get back here as quickly as possible. So, for instance, the other day I woke up and I was feeling flat, which, for whatever reason, I'm, you know, that happens sometimes. Now, my first thought was, oh, I've got a lot of stuff I've got to do today, so I just need to get to the office and grind through some work. But I just knew better than that. I thought, no, it's going to be far more useful for me to go do some stuff that's going to affect my state. So, I had, I had low motivation and low energy, but I just started with one or two things. I thought, I'm deliberately going to get dressed well. Okay, I can do that. Which cologne? That cologne. Okay, hmm, all right. Uh, where am I going? I'm going to my favorite coffee shop. Okay, well, I'm listening to my favorite music on the way to that favorite coffee shop. When I get there, um, I'm watching a Darren Brown YouTube clip. Something about that, which I just love that guy. I think he's extraordinary. Some of the cool things he shows about the power we have as people. So look, all that together took two hours out of my day. But by the end of that, I was back. <laughs> and boy, was I back. For the rest of that day, I was kicking goals. Uh, it, it was extraordinary. All because I focused on rituals and anchors, which, which created a great state, which then gave me access to what I really needed, which then got me the outcomes that I want. Like I think artists and sports people understand this intuitively better than, than most. An artist would be very aware of the fact that to go, to go paint a masterpiece, um, it's not just going to happen by sitting down and painting. 
They don't have access to the magic by sitting down and painting. They know that masterpieces are built in moments of extraordinary creativity, clarity, wisdom, insight, beauty. They're like spiritual moments. And they don't have access to that other than being in an extraordinary state. Sports people are the same. It's all about the magic. In our top sports people, it's not that they're just hard workers and disciplined and focused. Um, the difference between a good sports player and a great, like it might only be 1%, but it, we, we can see it when it happens. And, and the results are extraordinary. In, such a, in, a, in a competitive arena, it is all about the magic. So a great sportsman will, will understand this and have anchors and rituals that get them back into that zone as quickly as possible. You know, think about the Australian cricket team, often a player will be described as being out of form. You know, what does that mean? Does that mean that they can no longer play cricket? No, of course they can still play, but they don't have access to the ability to play. It's like, you know, they've lost all their technique, it's gone out the window, and it's all because of their state. Now that the possibilities and impossibilities have switched, now they're getting horrible outcomes. So a, a clever sportsman and someone who understands this will have great rituals. And maybe some even bordering on superstitions that just flick the switch, that just get them in the zone, because once they're in that state, then they have access to the magic. And once they've got access to the magic, then the outcomes they get are the ones we pay them the big bucks to, to, to entertain us with. So in thinking about this for you, right, uh, there's a couple of key things. One is obviously, who do you, sorry, what do you want? Get clear about that. Two is know why you want it. Then, then have this kind of this question. Who would you need to be? What kind of person gets those kind of results? And when you're thinking about who's at your table, um, there, there's some important aspects of this. One, it's just, it's just to gain awareness. Pull these characters out. Give them names. Discover what they're like. Explore their positive aspects and their negative ones. Their resourcefulness and their, their unresourcefulness. Uh, understand them. Understand their message. Just, just by seeing who's at your table... Um, it just gives you the ability then to have some control over what's happening. Uh, the second thing is to integrate them. So the aim is not to kill some of my characters or your characters. They all serve a purpose. They all have a positive intent. It's to understand them and, and use them in different, in different ways. Because they're all, they're all good at different things. Um, but the third thing is, so one is awareness, two is integration, three is invitation. So, you know, who created all my characters? You know, well, I did. So I could create another one. At the moment, um, Rusty is getting me. Rusty is who I would need to be to get what I really want. But there will come a time where the things that I want outstrip Rusty. You know, if, if one of my outcomes was to earn 100000 um, well, well, the kind of person I would need to be to earn 100000 would be very different from the kind of person I would need to be to earn a million dollars or to... to to sell a thousand books as opposed to selling ten thousand books, like I would need to be a different kind of person. So invitation is well, who would I need to be? Who would I need to invite to my table uh, to then get these results that I'm looking for? So then, once I've worked out who I would need to be, then what kind of rituals would I need to practice? What kind of life-giving things would create that incredible state for me? And then, once I'm in that state, how could I anchor it? How could I find trigger points? How could I find access points back into that space? Because state is king. State is king. Once you're in state, the game changes, and then you have access to what you really want. Then you become one of the, the third category of person that we started with, the person who knows what they want and who gets what they want. Look, I hope that's been useful. When I've shared that with people, it's been a game changer for so many people. Um, not necessarily because it's been a new idea, but one they've never languaged. I think, I think we get this intuitively, we understand it, yet if you can't language it, you can't have it. So I hope that that's been a really useful languaging and, and to get that out on, on paper so you go, of course, I can use that now. So I hope that's been useful for you. I hope it's useful for your friends. Please share that with anyone who you think might benefit from that. My name's Jamin Fraser. It's been a pleasure to talk with you today.